For unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. Matthew 25, 29. Chet Audio presents Outliers, the story of success. Written and read by Malcolm Gladwell. Featuring a special conversation with the author on CD7. Outlier, noun. One. Something that is situated away from or classed differently from a main or related body. 2. A statistical observation that is markedly different in value from the others of the sample. Introduction. The Rosetto Mystery. These people were dying of old age. That's it. Rosetto Valfatore lies 100 miles southeast of Rome, in the Apennine foothills of the Italian province of Foggia. In the style of medieval villages, the town is organized around a large central square. Facing the square is the Palazzo Marcasale, the palace of the Segese family, once the great landowner of these parts. An archway to one side leads to a church, the Madonna del Carmine. Narrow stone steps run up the hillside, flanked by closely clustered two-story stone houses, with red tile roofs. For centuries, the paisane of Rosetto worked in the marble quarries in the surrounding hills or cultivated the fields in the terraced valley below, walking four and five miles down the mountain in the morning and then making the long journey back up the hill at night. It was a hard life. The townsfolk were barely literate and desperately poor and without much hope for economic betterment until word reached Rosetta at the end of the 19th century of the land of opportunity across the ocean. In January of 1882, a group of 11 Rosettans, 10 men and one boy, set sail for New York. They spent their first night in America sleeping on the floor of a tavern on Mulberry Street in Manhattan's Little Italy. Then they ventured west, eventually finding jobs in a slate quarry 90 miles west of the city near the town of Bangor, Pennsylvania. The following year, 15 Rosettans left Italy for America, and several members of that group ended up in Bangor as well, joining their compatriots in the slate quarry. Those immigrants, in turn, sent word back to Rosetto about the promise of the new world, and soon one group of Rosettans after another packed their bags and headed for Pennsylvania, until the initial stream of immigrants became a flood. In 1894 alone, some 1,200 Rosettans applied for passports to America, leaving entire streets of their old village abandoned. The Rosettans began buying land on a rocky hillside, connected to Bangor by a steep, rutted wagon path. They built closely clustered two-story stone houses with slate roofs on narrow streets running up and down the hillside. They built a church and called it Our Lady of Mount Carmel and named the main street on which it stood Garibaldi Avenue after the great hero of Italian unification. In the beginning, they called their town New Italy, but they soon changed it to Rosetto, which seemed only appropriate given that in the previous decade almost all of them had come from the same village in Italy. In 1896, a dynamic young priest by the name of Father Pasquale de Nisco took over at Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Denisco set up spiritual societies and organized festivals. He encouraged the town folk to clear the land and plant onions, beans, potatoes, melons, and fruit trees in the long backyards behind their houses. He gave out seeds and bulbs. The town came to life. The Rosettans began raising pigs in their backyards and growing grapes for homemade wine. Schools, a park, a convent, and a cemetery were built. Small shops and bakeries and restaurants and bars opened along Garibaldi Avenue. More than a dozen factories sprang up, making blouses for the garment trade. 
Neighboring Bangor was largely Welsh and English, and the next town over was overwhelmingly German, which meant, given the fractious relationships between the English and Germans and Italians in those years, that Rosetto stayed strictly for Rosettans. If you had wandered up and down the streets of Rosetto in Pennsylvania in the first few decades after 1900, you would have heard only Italian spoken. And not just any Italian, but the precise southern Fogian dialect spoken back in the Italian Rosetto. Rosetto, Pennsylvania was its own tiny self-sufficient world, all but unknown by the society around it, and may well have remained so, but for a man named Stuart Wolf. Wolf was a physician. He studied digestion in the stomach and taught in a medical school at the University of Oklahoma. He spent his summers on a farm in Pennsylvania, not far from Rosetto, although that, of course, didn't mean much, since Rosetto was so much in its own world, it was possible to live one town over and never know much about it. One of the times when we were up there for the summer, this would have been in the late 1950s, I was invited to give a talk at the local medical society, Wolf said years later in an interview. After the talk was over, one of the local doctors invited me to have a beer. And while we were having a drink, he said, You know, I've been practicing for 17 years. I get patients from all over, and I rarely find anyone from Rosetto under the age of 65 with heart disease. Wolf was taken aback. This was the 1950s, years before the advent of cholesterol-lowering drugs and aggressive prevention of heart disease. Heart attacks were an epidemic in the United States. They were the leading cause of death in men under the age of 65. It was impossible to be a doctor, common sense said, and not see heart disease. Wolf decided to investigate. He enlisted the support of some of his students and colleagues from Oklahoma. They gathered together the death certificates from residents of the town, going back as many years as they could. They analyzed physicians' records. They took medical histories and constructed family genealogies. We got busy, Wolf said. We decided to do a preliminary study. We started in 1961. The mayor said, all my sisters are going to help you. He had four sisters. He said, you can have the town council room. I said, where are you going to have council meetings? He said, well, we'll postpone them for a while. The ladies would bring us lunch. We had little booths where we would take blood, do EKGs. We were there for four weeks. Then I talked with the authorities. They gave us the school for the summer. We invited the entire population of Rosetto to be tested. The results were astonishing. In Rosetto, virtually no one under 55 had died of a heart attack or showed any signs of heart disease. For men over 65, the death rate from heart disease in Rosetto was roughly half that of the United States as a whole. The death rate from all causes in Rosetto, in fact, was 30 or 35 percent lower than it should have been. Wolf brought in a friend of his, a sociologist from Oklahoma named John Brune, to help him. I hired medical students and sociology grad students as interviewers, and in Rosetta we went house to house and talked to every person aged 21 and over, Brune remembers. This happened more than 50 years ago, but Brune still had a sense of amazement in his voice as he described what they found. There was no suicide, no alcoholism, no drug addiction, and very little crime. They didn't have anyone on welfare. Then we looked at peptic ulcers. They didn't have any of those either. These people were dying of old age. That's it. Wolf's profession had a name for a place like Rosetto, a place that lay outside everyday experience, where the normal rules did not apply. Rosetto was an outlier. Wolf's first thought was that the Rosettans must have held on to some dietary practices from the old world that left them healthier than other Americans. But he quickly realized that wasn't true. The Rosettans were cooking with lard instead of the much healthier olive oil they'd used back in Italy. Pizza in Italy was a thin crust with salt oil and perhaps some tomatoes, anchovies, or onions. Pizza in Pennsylvania was bread dough plus sausage, pepperoni, salami, ham, and sometimes eggs. Sweets like biscotti and tarali used to be reserved for Christmas and Easter in Rosetto. Now they were eaten all year round. When Wolf had dietitians analyze the typical Rosettans' eating habits, he found that a whopping 41% of their calories came from fat. Nor was this a town where people got up at dawn to do yoga and run a brisk six miles. The Pennsylvanian Rosettans smoked heavily, and many were struggling with obesity. If it wasn't diet and exercise, then, what about genetics? 
The Rosettans were a close-knit group from the same region of Italy, and Wolfe's next thought was whether they were of a particularly hardy stock that protected them from disease. So he tracked down relatives of the Rosettans who were living in other parts of the United States to see if they shared the same remarkable good health as their cousins in Pennsylvania. They didn't. He then looked at the region where the Rosettans lived. Was it possible that there was something about living in the foothills of eastern Pennsylvania that was good for their health? The two closest towns to Rosetto were Bangor, which was just down the hill, and Nazareth, a few miles away. These were both about the same size as Rosetto and populated with the same kind of hard-working European immigrants. Wolf combed through both towns' medical records. For men over 65, the death rates from heart disease in Nazareth and Bangor were something like three times that of Rosetto. Another dead end. What Wolf began to realize was that the secret of Rosetto wasn't diet or exercise or genes or location. It had to be Rosetto itself. As Brune and Wolf walked around the town, they figured out why. They looked at how the Rosettans visited one another, stopping to chat in Italian on the street or cooking for each other in their backyards. They learned about the extended family clans that underlay the town's social structure. They saw how many homes had three generations living under one roof and how much respect grandparents commanded. They went to Mass at Our Lady of Mount Carmel and saw the unifying and calming effect of the church. They counted 22 separate civic organizations in a town of just under 2,000 people. They picked up on the particular egalitarian ethos of community that discouraged the wealthy from flaunting their success and helped the unsuccessful obscure their failures. In transplanting the Paisani culture of southern Italy to the hills of eastern Pennsylvania, the Rosettans had created a powerful protective social structure capable of insulating them from the pressures of the modern world. The Rosettans were healthy because of where they were from, because of the world they had created for themselves in their tiny little town in the hills. I remember going to Rosetto for the first time, and you'd see three generational family meals, all the bakeries, the people walking up and down the street, sitting on their porches talking to each other, the blouse mills where the women worked during the day while the men worked in the slate quarries, Brune said. It was magical. When Brune and Wolf first presented their findings to the medical community, you can imagine the kind of skepticism they faced. They went to conferences where their peers were presenting long rows of data arrayed in complex charts and referring to this kind of gene or that kind of physiological process, and they talked instead about the mysterious and magical benefits of people stopping to talk to one another on the street and having three generations living under one roof. Living a long life, the conventional wisdom said at the time, depended to a great extent on who we were, that is, our genes. It depended on the decisions people made, on what they chose to eat and how much they chose to exercise, and how effectively they were treated by the medical system. No one was used to thinking about health in terms of community. Wolf and Brune had to convince the medical establishment to think about health and heart attacks in an entirely new way. They had to get them to realize that you couldn't understand why someone was healthy if all you did was think about an individual's choices or actions in isolation. You had to look beyond the individual. You had to understand the culture they were a part of and who their friends and families were and what town their families came from. You had to appreciate the idea that the values of the world we inhabit and the people we surround ourselves with has a profound effect on who we are. In Outliers, I want to do for our understanding of success what Stuart Wolf did for our understanding of health.